research focus on water desalination. Um, and he can tell you a little bit more about that. He is also currently the president of the MIT Water Club. And in the long term, uh, David is interested in finding a position where he can continue to apply technical insights to environmental issues, um, particularly in the feedback. Um, and he's been a fellow of all different sorts, um, but one is for the American and the energy leadership. Um, Americans and energy leadership, that's right. And also the NRDC. So without further ado, um, everyone let's welcome David. Hi everybody, so uh, I know a bunch of you, but not everybody, and I'm looking forward to meeting uh, whoever I don't know at some point. Um, the way I figured I'd structure this is kind of walk you through some of the things I've been interested in uh, following in, in, the, in the whole space of water desalination as it relates to energy demand, as it relates to uh, water supply, as it relates to technical stuff and policy questions and political economy and everything. So it's going to go in a lot of different directions, and so what I figured is uh, we could just kind of either pause when we're more interested in some aspects uh, or keep going, and, and what I'll probably do is kind of walk through stuff if people want to interrupt me, you're welcome to do so, and we can just kind of have a conversation right there. Uh, or if you want to hold your questions until the end, we can do that too. So, but feel free to interrupt. Um, so I'm in the material science department. I work with uh, Professor Jeff Grossman, and, and what I focus on, which you'll be hearing a little bit about during the talk, is on the materials that actually go in the membranes uh, that separate salt from water in the desalination plant. Um, so, some, so a lot of technical stuff is really where I spend most of my time. And I'll have a little bit of technical stuff, but uh, this is not intended to be a purely uh, scientific um, presentation. So I'll try to kind of mix it up as well. Uh, just to get a show of hands from everybody. Yep, Zach? David, will you be sharing your slides? Uh, sure, yep, I can share my slides. Okay, no problem. The only caveat is I probably got a lot of these pictures from Google and stuff. <laughs> so I don't know whether I'm technically allowed to be doing that. But I'll, I'll share the slides happily. Um, <laughs> What was I going to say? Oh, quick show of hands. Who's who's um, a technical person? I like School of Engineering or Science. Okay. Um, okay. Well, actually, let's let's review this. Who's a science person? Like hard sciences. Okay. Um, who's more of a kind of TPP ESD type of technical person? Okay. And who's a business person? All right. What else am I missing? Planners, okay. Well, planners somewhere in there. We're uh, in the mix all over the place. <laughs> cool, okay. Planners. Other categories I'm missing? Okay, that's it. Great, okay. So that gives me a bit of a sense of kind of what to focus on. Okay, so water desalination. Um, broadly speaking, that's the process of taking water uh, that's too salty to use uh, for agriculture, too salty to drink, uh, too salty to use for uh, industrial processes and so forth and uh, basically trying to purify it to the point where you're actually getting rid of most of the salt so you can use it. Uh, that's what desalination is, and it's a technology that's gotten a lot of um, additional traction in the last, say, decade. It used to be very much relegated to uh, Gulf countries, countries that had a lot of oil to spare and uh, no other water. It was expensive and nobody else would really have any interest in doing it. Uh, that's starting to change, and that's kind of why we care. Uh, there's obviously a lot of salt water around, uh, and we're running out of water in other sources. So where does this fit in? What, you know, what does that have to do with uh, the big part of the world that doesn't have a very um, developed water infrastructure today and a lot of kind of growing demand? And what does it mean for energy is kind of the stuff I'm, I'm interested in exploring. So let's see what this clicker actually works. Yes, OK. Um, Almeria province is um, basically right next to Andalusia. Actually, it might even be part of Andalusia. Uh, it's in Spain. This is the desalination plant that provides uh, a large share of the water uh, to El Maria. So they take water from the Mediterranean, it goes through the system, you get fresh water on the other end. Uh, it's great, it works well, nobody's uh, complaining about it, but uh, it consumes about a third of the province's power. That's just give you a sense. Uh, it could be more or less in different parts of, uh, of, uh, of the world, but we're talking about massive amounts of energy, and we're also talking about a place that probably wouldn't have water and agriculture and a lot of that uh, type of economic sector uh, if it weren't for that plant. So downsides, upsides, uh, and a lot of places in the world that are thinking, oh, what if you build one of these? Um, is it feasible economically, you know, as, uh, in terms of environment and so forth? Um, a lot to be figured out there. Uh, probably a lot of us are pretty convinced that clean water matters, and this is something we want to think about. Um, here's some estimates about how much electricity demand is supposed to increase in the next 20 years or so. 
And uh, short stories, electricity demand is probably going to uh, double in the next 20 years. And you can kind of see, and we know this, most of the demand is really going to come from uh, uh, the developing world and emerging countries. Uh, water, I don't have the breakdown of developed and developing countries, but you can see uh, probably three times more demand uh, for water in the next 20 years. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big deal, and, uh, and, and the fact that there's going to be a lot of demand for water is going to be compounded by the fact that uh, we're kind of running out of uh, traditional sources of water. Uh, so, you know, uh, basically surface water from you know, river withdrawals and so forth, uh, groundwater, through wells and stuff like that. Uh, we're starting to deplete that in many parts of the world faster uh, than it's being replenished. And uh, with growing population, uh, growing demand per person due to economic growth and higher standards of living and stuff like that, um, we've got to figure out uh, ways to you know, reduce demand and also increase supply of water. This is a, a, a chart. This is a great report that I recommend uh, anybody who's interested to look at. It's called um, Charting Our Water uh, Future, I think. It's mostly done by McKinsey people. And they're very interested in kind of questions of supply and demand and the role of uh, emerging countries in the whole water picture. Um, massive gap here between uh, demand and supply of water in the next 20 years. And, uh, and desalination maybe has some role to play there. Uh, desalination, as I mentioned, makes sense because uh, basically almost all the water on Earth is uh, salty today. Um, and among the water that's not salty, a lot of it is unavailable because it's in icebergs and uh, glaciers and stuff like that, so we can't access it. Um, if we can find a way to kind of cheaply and sustainably tap some of this water, um, we're good. Now, can we do that? Well, one good thing is that the cost of desalination, uh, in terms of you know per cubic meter of liter uh, uh, of water, that's actually been going down uh, compared to several decades ago. That has a lot to do with the technology. Um, to some extent, it's simply economy, uh, you know, economies of scale. Most of it is technology. And meanwhile, um, maybe this is the downside. Other water supply options have gotten more expensive as the kind of low-hanging fruit is, is running out. Um, so maybe we're at a point where in some parts of the world, uh, this is kind of an enthusiastic, you know, optimistic chart by GE Water, and they sell diesel systems. So uh, you probably have a different chart, depending on who you look at. Uh, maybe we're getting to a point, uh, or we've gotten to a point, where traditional water supply options uh, just aren't economical anymore, uh, and therefore we've got to start thinking about taking water from uh, the sea or other saline sources and use that for our water supply. Um, but it's still expensive, so this is kind of like the converse of this. Uh, this is the McKinsey folks again. Uh, cost of water per cubic meter. Uh, if you take agricultural measures to try to save water, you actually save money, right? Uh, because you're spending less on water in the long run. Uh, if you use groundwater measures, uh, to try to uh, get water more uh, sustainably, uh, then it's, you've got to spend money, but it's small amount, right? Desalination, totally different order of magnitude. Uh, this is actually even kind of optimistic, but we're talking uh, a dollar per cubic meter, more or less, um, sometimes more. So that's a lot of water, uh, that's a lot of money for, for water, and uh, it's not clear how much that can go down, and which parts of it can go down, and what that means in the long run. Um, basically what it means is this. Uh, this is a desalination plant. I was actually at it in uh, last December, a year ago. It's in Israel. Uh, it's the Hadera plant, uh, which supplies uh, a big chunk of the, of the water in Israel. It's, uh, it's very efficient, and uh, it's one of the kind of cheapest uh, water-producing plants in the world, so people are very proud of it. Uh, it works great, technically. Uh, but you can kind of see, I'm going to give you a bit more of a, a sense of what happens to these plants. But essentially, you've got all these different vessels here. Uh, they're all long cylinders, and the water goes through it, and uh, brine comes out, and fresh water comes out. Um, how many of these are there? There's membranes inside. There's 70,000 membranes in this plant. Uh, and you've got to replace them every uh, three years or so. So you can kind of see, this plant is huge. There's another room that looks exactly like it. Uh, and in the back, you've got these massive six megawatt pumps that are actually producing uh, uh, giving the pressure and consuming energy to do so, uh, to get the water through. In terms of why desalination is expensive, a lot of it's capital costs. These are big plants, as I mentioned. Um, the other part is energy. Almost half of, uh, of the cost of desalinated water is basically electricity. Uh, and that has a lot to do with why people are concerned about the environmental footprint of, uh, of desalination. Um, OK, so this is kind of a blown up uh, picture of that, so we don't need to spend too much time on it. Here's a tiny bit for the physics of desalination. Uh, we start. What's the cost? Yeah. What's the rough order of magnitude in Israel? Like, how much money are we talking? We are talking um, hundreds of millions of dollars in capital costs. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly, but maybe 300 million, something like that. Um, and then 
the energy obviously is spread over the lifetime of the plant, that's operational cost. Um, and so this is a plant that typically will, will produce, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, basically maybe 50 million, 100 million cubic meters per year. It's a lot of water for like the size of a country. How, much, like, how many cities is that? Um, <clears throat> or like about how many cities? Um, a couple, big a couple big cities. Yeah, because basically we've got three, four big desalination plants in, in Israel. We're on the same order of magnitude as a power plant. Yeah, yeah. Both capital and output. Yeah, exactly. And actually, yeah, I guess you can put it that way in order of magnitude. And in terms of size, I think. Um, what was I going? Just very briefly, the physics. So we're talking, we're starting with salt water. The stage I'm not showing here is actually quite involved. It's getting rid of all the stuff that's not salt. Uh, you know, the bacteria, the uh, plankton, the, uh, the uh, suspended solids, uh, organic material, fish, you know, all that other stuff that's in the water uh, before they get to the membranes. That's a big deal. It's kind of low tech in a way, and that hasn't really evolved, evolved too much. It mostly involves kind of having water trickle down through sand and then replacing the sand from time to time. Um, but it still consumes energy because it's got, it takes a lot of space and you're trying to pump this water through the sand and so forth. Uh, but not a lot of high tech stuff going there. Um, the high tech part, the really difficult part, is once you have water with a lot of salt, and we're talking about a lot of salt. Um, Seawater is about 30 grams per liter, that's so about 3% salt, uh, it can be even more. Um, you're trying to get rid of it, and it takes a lot of energy based on thermodynamics. You've got these uh, cylinders I was talking about, the membranes, and if you can force water uh, using pressure to go through the membrane, then you'll get what we call permeate water, which is the fresh water that people can actually drink. And then uh, the other half or so of the water that hasn't gone through by the end uh, is dumped as brine. And so uh, either you put that back in the sea, or if you're in an inland desalination plant and you're pumping water from a well that's salty, you've got to truck it to the ocean, or you can put it back underground and hope it stays there. Um, and basically, the amount of flux you get of fresh water is proportional both to how, how much pressure you're applying, uh, which is here, um, how salty the water is. If the water is salty, you've got to apply more pressure and the permeability of the membrane, uh, if, it's, if it lets water uh, go through easily or not, which is something that you can uh, play with in terms of the uh, science here. I'm just curious, is anyone making useful, um, making use of the brine anywhere in the world as opposed um, to just dumping it back in the people ocean? People are kind of trying, although most people dump it. There's a couple things you can do with brine. You can try to get stuff out of it. Uh, salt is pretty cheap, you know, like sodium chloride. Uh, that doesn't make too much sense. Magnesium is relatively valuable. Uh, so people are looking at processes to try to just get only the magnesium and then sell that. Uh, and if you look at the cost of uh, the magnesium, you know, the price of the magnesium that you could get out of a, a cubic meter of, of seawater and how much it costs to desalinate that, you'd actually make a profit if you were able to get the, the, the magnesium out. The thing is it's part of a story of lots of nasty stuff and people aren't too good at that. And the other thing people try to do with the variety is sometimes uh, generate power from it uh, to try to offset the electricity uh, in the first place. but it's very minor compared to how much you're putting in. From the salinity gradient? Yeah, from the salinity gradient. Um, so people are trying to do that, but it's just kind of really pilot stuff. For the most part, they just don't be able to truck it. Uh, and if it's an inland plant, it's actually a big part of the cost is trucking the water back. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, right. Um, I like to ask question, but like, how do you purify it in the first step? Why, why isn't there just a membrane? The as well. well, so if you took seawater uh, sea or whatever and just put it directly in here, uh, the membrane would get fouled immediately. Lots of stuff would just stick to the surface, mm -hmm. and that would be that. And but it just gets clogged. The... So what happens is that first you remove as much as possible of the stuff that could clog the membrane, um, biological material and so forth. Uh, and then to the extent that stuff is get, kind of getting stuck here, people will essentially have to replace the membranes every so often, every three years of it. Uh, we say after it's purified, oh, after it's purified. go to another membrane, which, you know, there, uh, why is pressure required, which requires energy, rather than gravity, which is doing the... Uh, oh, so the, why do you need pressure to make it go through here? Yeah. Uh, thermodynamics, essentially, if you didn't apply pressure, water would go from the fresh side through the membrane uh, to the salty side, simply because you've got very different uh, salt concentrations. And if you've got something that's very salty in contact with something that's not very salty, uh, the water's going to want to go through the membrane to try to equalize the concentrations. So there's a minimum from thermodynamics in terms of how much pressure and how much energy you've got to apply. And uh, people get kind of enthusiastic about how much more energy efficient desalt could be, uh, but there's really a limit. And uh, actually, I'm going to talk about this, but we're pretty close to that limit already. Yep. What are the environmental considerations, if anything, significant of disposing of the brine? Uh, 
big deal. Uh, it has a lot to do with local ecosystems, and it's not my, my specialty, but my understanding is that uh, if you're by the sea or by the ocean, uh, people usually go through great lengths to figure out what the effect of greater salinity would be locally. Uh, I'm talking on the order of like you know a mile, that length scale. And uh, if you're in an ecosystem where it doesn't matter, uh, like in Spain I was talking about, it doesn't matter, so they just literally have a pipe that just discharges back out. Uh, other parts of the world, I think Australia is one of them, uh, it would totally mess up the ecosystem if you just have big salinity gradients like that. So then they have essentially these sprinkler, these sprinkler systems that diffuse the salt out so that there's no kind of spike. Uh, it's more expensive, but sometimes you gotta do it. Um, and then if you're inland, obviously there's, uh, you know, big problems if you start dumping sea water, you know, really, really you know, briny water uh, back in, into rivers or whatever. Um, so that's why it ends up being much more expensive to, to get rid of the, the brine. Uh, in some sense, it's kind of analogous to what people are noticing in the whole shale gas uh, and hydraulic fracturing uh, field in the United States, where they're ending up with very nasty water that usually doesn't come from desalination, but comes from the whole extraction process. What do you do with it? Do you put it underground? Do you chuck it somewhere else? Do you try to evaporate all the water and just have solid waste? Uh, they're still trying to figure that out, and it's, I think it's a really important question. Let's go with it. Um, this is kind of the math, uh, or the related to what you were talking about. This is kind of answering the question of how much more energy, how much more energy efficiency could we get out of desalination? Uh, how much more energy efficient it can be? And essentially, without going into too much of the math, uh, there's a theoretical minimum. Uh, that you just can't go below. Uh, that has to do with how much water you're recovering. If I put in a one liter of seawater and I want to get uh, a half a liter of uh, fresh water out, so that would be like about here on this uh, percent recovery uh, chart, then there's a certain minimum that I'm not going to be able to go below. Uh, otherwise, I just wouldn't get the water. Um, there is extra energy that's associated with the configuration of these uh, cylinders, but let's not go into that. Uh, not so much we can do about it anyway unless we totally change the, the engineering. And finally, there's a part that has to do with the permeability of the membranes. If my membrane is pretty thick and doesn't really let water through very quickly, then in addition to all this uh, kind of minimum stuff, I need to apply more energy, uh, you know, more pressure in order to get the water to go through faster. Because otherwise I would have an infinitely large plant to produce like one liter per day or whatever. Um, and this is where hopefully we have a chance uh, to have a more energy efficient desalination. Uh, system by having membranes that don't require all this extra energy. Uh, that's partially what I work on, so I'll talk about that a little bit more. But for the most part, essentially, in orders of magnitude, because I haven't talked about numbers here, we're talking about, about uh, three kilowatt hours per cubic meter of, uh, of fresh water, more or less. Um, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? I mean, it's decent, right? We talked about that plant in Spain and a, and a third of their power. Um, but to put it into perspective, because I don't want people to think that it's like totally outlandish, uh, Heating a cubic meter of, of, uh, of water for showers or whatever, which a lot of our um, hot water heaters at home do, that takes about 70 cubic meters. So, uh, a lot more, right? 70 kilowatt hours? Uh, what did I say? Three yes. Kilowatt okay, hours. kilowatt hours, yeah. So, three versus 70. So, very different orders of magnitude. Uh, heating water is still a bigger um, energy problem than desalination. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, that's kind of Can you give me a perspective on what the the use for water is like I, I mean, I'm sure that the fraction that goes to giving hot showers to people in the like suburbs or something is much smaller yeah. than to what people need to like pump into various dishes. A lot of water goes to agriculture. A lot of water, and that obviously doesn't. Get, so that's why we don't care about it as much. Um, that's where desalination starts to be kind of iffy because. Um, did I mention cost? Yeah, about a dollar per cubic meter. That's uh, about a cent per oh wait about a tenth of a cent per liter, right? Um, that's pretty cheap, you know? You, you, a bottle of, you know, bottled water costs like two bucks or something, so a, half, you know, a tenth of a cent doesn't sound like too much. Uh, certainly not for drinking purposes. People would be willing to pay that. Um, for agriculture, though, that's a totally different ballgame, and uh, food prices would totally go crazy if uh, farmers had to pay a uh, dollar per cubic meter. So that's kind of where that's it. And then I guess there's water, a lot of water that goes to cooling down power plants. But that water can be salty, so there's no need to use desalination for that, um, for the most part. Um, okay, so here's a tiny bit about my work on the scientific side for, for the technical people here. Um, I'm interested in trying to see whether you could have a membrane that's thinner and would let water through faster, so that you can uh, get water out, get water uh, you know, through the membrane faster, uh, so you have a smaller plant, 
and also uh, consume less energy. And so I've been looking at a material called graphene, uh, which is one atom thick. You can have uh, holes in it that would let uh, water through, but not salt. And, uh, and the idea there is to basically have more efficient desalination. Um, we're still trying to make this, so I'm, I'm more of a prediction kind of guy. Uh, but where this puts us, just based on uh, you know the physics of it, is if current desalination membranes have about 100% salt rejection, they're really good at rejecting salt, uh, pretty low permeability to water in terms of how much you get out for a given pressure, um, these graphene membranes, they'd be a factor of 100 or 500 times um, or more permeable. And so what that would mean is you couldn't go down below that thermodynamic limit, uh, but you could uh, get better um, uh, flux and you could kind of get as close to the limit as possible. Um, I think I want to show you guys this one graph from my research. Here we're looking at, okay, well suppose you did have a membrane that was much more permeable, like this graphene stuff I'm talking about. And what could you do with it? And here's two things you could do with it. You could kind of go up and down this y-axis, which is energy consumption. Or you could kind of change the flow rate, the throughput um, of each uh, cylinder. And we've got three colors here for three different types of water. Uh, this is seawater, which is what I've been talking about for the most part. Um, let's forget about the black for a second. Orange here is brackish water. So this is water that's usually inland from uh, underground and stuff like that, or, or even from lakes that are salty. Uh, much less salty though, about you know, 10 times uh, less salty than, than seawater. Uh, what you'll notice in all these cases is that you can kind of go down. You can reduce the energy consumption, but you can only go from you know, whatever it is, 3 to 2.8 or whatever, uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter in the case of seawater. There's that minimum that's, so here these uh, solid lines are current membranes, and this is the options you've got essentially, and this is where you could get, right? And so you kind of go down, but not that much, or you could kind of have a lot more throughput. And uh, this is totally different though, right? Um, the size of these arrows are about the same, but here you know, we're going from 15 to 7 or whatever, uh, and here we're going from 3 to 2.8. And, and what that means essentially is that you could cut the energy consumption of brackish water desalination uh, by much more, more like 60% rather than uh, 5 or 8%. Um, and this is why, I mean, this is why I see a, a huge opportunity essentially for uh, much cheaper desalination, not of seawater, even though there's a lot of seawater out there, uh, but for basically inland sources that are too salty to use today. And, uh, and I think that in a lot of parts of the world that don't use desalination today, uh, there might be a, a lot of opportunity. Um, Here's for the bigger picture. I'm going to kind of keep this slide up and mention some things that I've been interested in beyond the technical stuff. So, you know, what, what have we talked about so far? We talked about the fact that desalination consumes a lot of energy. It's uh, pretty cheap when it comes to drinking and stuff like that, but it's relatively expensive if you want it to be your main source of water, including agriculture. We've talked about the fact that the energy consumption is kind of limited. Uh, I mean, there's like a, a minimum that you can't go below, uh, except if you're using uh, much less salty uh, water. Um, and I think those are probably the main things that, uh, that we talked about so far. Here's some other thoughts. Here's a cost curve. You guys might have seen these for uh, um, carbon dioxide. Uh, McKinsey's very good at making these cost curves that basically give you the options for how much it would cost to, well, in this case, produce extra water. Um, and you go from the, the options that would save you money if you invested in them, uh, better farming and agriculture for the most part, efficiency type stuff. Uh, you could reduce that water consumption and also save money, all the way to stuff that's getting very, very expensive. And guess where desalination is? It's all the way on the right. It's basically the most expensive thing you could do, at least in a country like India. Um, what that means is that there's a lot of stuff that we sh really shouldn't forget about when we um, pick technical solutions to, to water problems. Um, is India doing desalination? Absolutely. Uh, Chennai is building, I forget whether it's one or several big desalination plants. and. Uh, you know, Chennai is not known to be a particularly rich part of the world, um, but they're finding that uh, you know their traditional water options are going, you know, the price is going up. Desalination's gotten a bit gotten a bit cheaper, and a lot something about the politics of it also makes it very attractive to invest in a desalination plant rather than putting a lot of money into uh, drainage and uh, industrial levers and, and whatnot. Um, but I really think we shouldn't forget about this stuff. And this is the case for India. China's kind of doing the same stuff, although I don't have a graph here. Uh, I was recently in uh, the city of Tianjin outside of Beijing, and uh, they're building a lot of desalination plants, mostly for industry, but they're starting to do it for municipal water as well. Algeria has a lot of desalination plants. And even here in, in kind of, um, uh, in the developed world, in California and Australia and Spain, uh, people are building desalination plants today, either because they're running out of water, because they think they might, 
or sometimes because they were running out of water, and that's another point I want to bring up. There's a lot of desalination plants today that are sitting idle. Um, why are they sitting idle? They're sitting idle because there is a drought or there is some kind of uh, water crisis. Uh, people felt the need to do something, and usually, especially the kind of political figures felt the need to say they were doing something. So they built a desalination plant, and guess what? When it opened, it started raining, and they haven't needed it since then. And so the plant runs, but then they put the water down the drain because it would be it would, the plant would kind of uh, deteriorate if you didn't run. But then they don't need the water. Um, yep. Can you explain why some of the methods the cost of additional water is negative? Say that again. For some methods, the cost of additional water is negative. Negative. Yeah, it means you would actually save money in addition to getting more water. So the equivalent in the energy world is uh, energy efficiency, right? You invest in like uh, uh, extra insulation for your home and you reduce your energy bill that way. Um, but you reduce your energy consumption, but you're also saving money. Um, yeah. Whereas something like you know buying solar power from somebody else, you get more energy, but you have to pay for it. So that's kind of the difference. You want to pick this stuff to the extent that you can. Um, OK, so where does this leave us? You know, We've talked about a lot of things. I'm interested in the technical stuff. And I'm, I mean, that's kind of what I do on a regular basis. So I'm happy to talk about technical stuff. Um, but there's a lot of other questions, too, right? For the, um, policy people here and the political economists in the room, how do we come up with ways to incentivize kind of efficiency-based measures uh, in the face of water, uh, kind of growing water demand, rather than building large projects and then realizing you don't need them? Um, that's an, a question on the, on the policy side. How do we figure out the pricing? I haven't talked uh, too much about who ends up paying for the water that's more expensive. Uh, for the most part, it's the government, because uh, in a lot of the, in a lot of, uh, of the world, um, it just wouldn't be politically acceptable to uh, charge people 10 times more water from one month to the next because you switch to desalination. So in places like China, um, probably India, and, uh, and I'm assuming it's like that in, in, uh, in, in the West as well, uh, the government or the water utility has to kind of eat a lot of that extra cost. And what that does is that it doesn't incentivize uh, saving water, right? Um, and there's that kind of distortion there. How do we do desalination so that you know, if it's worth it to people, they pay for it. And if it's not worth it to people, they don't pay for it. And then the problem solved. Um, a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, and then what do we do with this whole brackish water stuff? Um, a lot of parts of the world, uh, including parts of the world where uh, you know, water demand's growing, don't have access to uh, a coastline, right? Um, that's good. Maybe we'll be able to help them through kind of lower energy consumption desalination uh, systems. But then how do we do that? You know, what kind of water sources are we talking about, um, and how to kind of balance that against uh, the kind of unsustainable tapping of groundwater uh, reservoirs that people are doing today? Um, those are a lot of questions that are unanswered, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to um, ne necessarily get to the bottom of all of them, but hopefully we can uh, brainstorm about all of them together, and uh, I can also just answer questions and stuff like that. So I'll leave it here, and uh, I'll thank you for listening so, so patiently. Thank you. Great. How much of the 97% of undrinkable water is correct? Um, most of it is the ocean water. <laughs> yeah. So, but is most like 97% of that 97%? So it's like a really small incremental kind of extra resource. That would be, uh, or it would still be double our freshwater reserves. Sure. Yeah. Essentially, I guess if anybody has more detailed data, feel free to share. Um, my sense is that if we go back to that chart all the way at the beginning about. Um, the water and the, all that stuff. This chart, if you look at the size of, kind of global human demand for water, it wouldn't be a big amount. We don't need, honestly, we don't need all. We don't need this much water. Sure. Um, so if we can get a sliver that's this big, I think that's a big deal. Um, al although it is attractive to say, oh, we have unlimited, you know, virtually unlimited supply. So, yeah. it's but it's also, yeah. I mean, it's not feasible to think that we would. You know, desalinate the, all the volume of the ocean. Yeah. So yeah. nor would it be feasible to desalinate yeah. all the fractured water. Yeah. You would do some tiny fraction. Yeah. But you don't have a sense of the how much there is. My guess um, is that most of the salt water is, is uh, kind of in the sea of the ocean. Yeah, you only talked about reverse osmosis and other kind of competing technologies which yeah. don't have that theoretical limit of they all have a theoretical limit. So this is where the reverse osmosis came in. I kind of implied that there's only one way of doing desalination, namely getting water through these filters. Um, 
it's not true, there's other ways of doing it. Uh, the most traditional way, the one that was basically used uh, for most of the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, was uh, one of two thermal desalination methods. And in layman's terms, it's basically boiling the water. You're heating it up and, and getting the salt, or uh, getting the water to evaporate. Um, it's more um, elaborate than just boiling the water, but essentially it reduces to that. And what happens is that these, these plants, uh, people still build them actually, they're um, more capital efficient, so they're cheaper to build up front, uh, but they consume a lot more energy. So if you've got unlimited oil, uh, you still continue to build those plants. Uh, you've still got that theoretical limit, and that, there's nothing you can do about that limit, unfortunately. Why that limit have to do with the diffusion potentials? No, it just has to do with the, make the, the entropy of mixing of, uh, of fresh water and salt water. Yeah, so I don't think we can do much about that. Yeah, right. But just to build on that, there is the opportunity for cogeneration of water and power. Yep. <clears throat> you could use that technology. You could burn the oil or coal or whatever for yeah. for power and then just use the waste heat to, to yeah. fuel your, your... Yeah, so usually thermal plants do work in cogen mode. Um, the question, the thing is they just take a hit on, on, on efficiency and power produced, so they're still kind of consuming energy in that sense. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities for figuring out uh, where to get energy from places we weren't using it. So solar desalination uh, is getting a lot of traction today. I haven't talked about it because I'm not an expert, but in places where energy is very expensive or where there's no grid and so forth, um, there's a lot of reason to try to get the sun uh, or other renewable forms of energy uh, to try to power this whole process. Um, waste heat's another thing, like actual waste heat. So there's been a lot, bunch of technologies um, one of them is called forward osmosis, and instead of pushing water through membranes, it basically involves sucking water across the membrane by having something even saltier than salt on the other side. Um, and you could do that using uh, waste heat, if you will, that currently just gets dumped into the environment. Um, so people are looking at that stuff as well. So, I'm assuming that you can't burn salt water, or can't use salt water in, in turbines for, for steam? Um, just, no, like in the actual... That the turbine... Yeah, I think it would, it would mess up. Is you that need material for materials innovation? Mm. Yeah. Coatings for materials innovation? Because we're going to be making tons of steam to run all our power plants. Totally, yeah. Um, you can burn salt water, you can burn it, boil salt water. Does anybody know more about um, when you boil it? Power generation? Yeah, you, you, you foul the stuff before yeah. the turbine. Destroy your turbine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's very gross. I mean, you, you, use, you can use seawater to cool power plants. To cool them. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a re kind of They have part. They have turbines that work under in the water on currents under the water, right? So that it is capable of being done. Yeah, my sense, not being a, a mechanical engineer, is that there's a lot of water that's used in power plants uh, to cool down the plant, and that could be seawater. Uh, and that is, there's still uh, work to be done there to make sure you can use as much seawater as, as you can, as opposed to withdrawing from the river and evaporating that. Um, but that is pretty much okay. And then there's uh, the kind of internal cycle. Uh, that tends to be a closed loop as far as I know. So you get, you, right now people use uh, kind of ultra pure water, that actually they use the same process. They take tap water and then they desalinate some more. Uh, so it's ultra pure. But the thing is it doesn't really do that loop. So even if you desalinated it, it would still be, stay there anyway. So you have the secondary loop. So why don't they do that now with the secondary loop? The full loop. Um, like why aren't you recondensing the evaporative water into drinkable water? Is there an energy penalty in that? Um, is there an energy to see it go up and you know, capture it? You're seeing it like a giant yeah. still, right? Capture all that steam. I don't know. That sounds really cool. Yeah. I'm assuming there's some reason, but I don't know. I guess you, you need energy to recondense it. Would you? Right. Can you come back to the cost curve? Yeah. yeah. Um, Essentially, 
Yeah, I mean, agriculture is, is really one of the kind of the need for more agriculture and more food to kind of feed the planet is really one of the one of the drivers for more water demand. And from that perspective, it seems kind of at, at odds with uh, the growth in desalination. Because we were kind of saying that desalination for agriculture is not a really, really viable way to do it, um, unless it's you know very, very high value crops. Um, so that's kind of at odds. And I think you know my take on that is that essentially, to the extent that you are a country that whose water demand is really increasing due to agriculture, desalination is not going to be your option. And not even, that won't even in, 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 you know involve any intelligence. You'll just do the economics and realize it doesn't make sense. Um, I guess that's the main thing I would say from that perspective. Um, yeah. Um, there's also, um, maybe you know about this, uh, they've been doing some experiments with uh, condensing water out of the air and some like sort of big... Oh, like cold, fog harvesting stuff? Yeah, like yeah. big cool greenhouses type of, like huge greenhouse plant type yeah. thing. And um, also, there's, there's also like um, an effect that a forest causes rain to fall on it yeah. because it's cooler there. Yeah. And it, I guess it makes the water damage cause rain to happen. You know? I think those things are really promising. Um, so, you know, so like somewhere, if they could get a lot of plants growing in, this, in a desert, near a desert somehow yeah. due to some type of desalination or something, and then somehow encase it in, in something and then keep it cooler and, and amplify the sort of cooling effect. Yeah, I think that's. I, I think there's a lot of value in kind of lower tech solutions, um, and it's really worth thinking about that. Um, in terms of the fog harvesting, kind of humidity harvesting type of technologies, actually some folks are working on that at MIT, uh, and they've gone a long way. So it's it's really good for communities that are really kind of off the grid, remote, especially in mountains where there's kind of a lot of clouds going through, uh, and it can really help local. The downside is in terms of the amount of water you get per square meter of land you're occupying, it's pretty low. So you've got to have a lot of land and, and be a pretty small community to have it work. Yep. How do these plants scale? In terms of what? Costs and efficiency and As other in, like, things we care about. Yeah. I mean, like, what's the, what is the, the smallest plant practical plant and are we always going bigger and bigger? Um, people are going bigger. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the scaling, I would want to look at that into a bit more detail before I could like give you um, specifics. But essentially, what you find is that there's a lot of places that are doing um, desalination at the smaller scale. And in terms of um, energy costs, it doesn't make a huge difference because a lot of stuff is happening in parallel. Right? Um, so who uses desalination in addition to these big places I was talking about? Uh, islands use desalination a lot because they don't have a lot of extra fresh water. And uh, it's really bad for them because they've got very high cost of energy, right? So if you think of a place in the Caribbean or Hawaii or places like that, um, they use desalination as a big part of their actual budget, you know, financial budget, and the cost of energy, cost of water ends up being very high. Um, those plants, um, they tend to run uh, a bit more expensive, but mostly because of the energy and because they're older plants. Um, in terms of the scaling, I think the reason you're seeing uh, kind of the drive towards bigger plants is simply because it's very, very easier to manage and then there's only one, I guess it's kind of like, I was going to say it's like nuclear plants, except you're kind of seeing the drive towards smaller nuclear plants now too. So there's kind of always going to be that balance. It's tempting to make a very big plant because then you've got only one project to manage and um, everything kind of scales the same and so forth. So the, there's that economy of scale. But on the other hand, a smaller system where you're able to custom, you know, basically tap the, the most favorable source of water and not dump you know ridiculous amounts of brine um, and manage it kind of more locally. I think there's probably going to be a lot of that as well. Um, the tubes that were yeah. being used, the cylinders are being used, seem pretty small and there's like you know, thousands of them or something. Yeah. Is the limiting factor in their size the size of the membrane? Um, it would it save capital costs? I assume to get maybe less materials that we could get a lot of so, better. Right. There's, so here's how these work. Um, you can tell, uh, so here's how they work. Essentially, this is a tube. It's about seven meters in length and about, you know, this uh, wide so far. Uh, what's this? Is basically, a high pressure vessel. It's just kind of the container. Uh, what goes inside of it, just kind of like the way you would double A batteries, is a bunch of kind of one meter long membranes. And what's inside of a membrane, if you take it apart, is a long, long sheet of uh, this membrane material and a kind of uh, support layer. And they wrap it up uh, like a paper towel roll and they encase it. 
and then they kind of put these all in in series. And so the water goes to the first one, and the second one, and the third one. Um, and the water is basically going between all these different layers that are wrapped up. Uh, you can make a thicker one, and people are actually doing that. So you're kind of uh, uh, thinking along the right lines. Um, in Israel, they're kind of they just launched a plant that has, instead of having these 8-inch vessels, they have 16-inch vessels. And then the idea is that essentially you're getting, um, you know, you only increase, you only doubled it, but you got this, you know, four times more area, right? Um, there's a lot of kind of engineering stuff there. People are kind of skeptical, um, but it makes a lot of sense. So there's kind of industrial questions about yeah, whether capital costs are still 37% of your costs. Yeah. But yeah, but you could have a plant that's much smaller. So that'd be nice. If you could kind of... And uh, you know, build a wall here. And <laughs> you may have mentioned this before I got here, but I mean, one of the biggest drivers, my understanding anyway, of not just capital costs but operating costs is the total dissolved solids concentration at the site. Yeah. Um, and that I think, well, first of all, that's hugely variable across the world, and it doesn't doesn't that have you know that's one of the biggest drivers of, of costs in 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 these desal facilities. And you mean the fact that the water is salt, the yeah, saltier? Yeah, saltier. Yeah, saltier is, is yeah. more expensive. Well, basically, I guess the way I would put it is, salty water means higher minimum energy, right? And higher minimum energy means more of this. Um, so that's the biggest thing, right? I guess you need a bit of a fancier plant if your water is very salty. So um, plants in Israel are kind of along along the Mediterranean have to be a bit fancier because the water is saltier there. Um, for the most part, it just means they have to consume a lot more energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are the um Membranes themselves, like a significant aspect of the cost of the yeah. membrane. Well, those membranes? It depends what you mean by significant. They're about five percent of the cost of water. Is it very much between different types of membranes? <laughs> no, it's kind of a commodity business right now. Okay. Um, a member like one of these tubes costs about five hundred bucks and uh, and everybody sells them at about the same price. And it's an interesting thing to look at actually because um, I've been very interested in what would happen if you had a better membrane, right? That's kind of what I do. And it turns out people who've developed better membranes, if you will, in the last few decades, they've had a very hard time um, getting more money uh, for the membrane compared to kind of the existing competition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they'll start pricing their, their system at, you know, twice the, the, the uh, kind of competitive, competing price because they know they can save a lot of money to these plants and then nobody will buy them. Because there's this perception, hey, it's supposed to be cheap, what the hell? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so they have to kind of bargain themselves down until they were just, you know, 10 or 20 percent more expensive, and then people start thinking about it. Um, so that's kind of tough. Um, but on the upside, it means that water is cheaper. That's good. Um, so you may have mentioned this before, but uh, do you know if people are um, using uh, solar concentrators to distill water, you know, to evaporate it? Or There's a, a whole field around solar stills, which are essentially a fancy version of a greenhouse with water on the bottom that water evaporates and then it condenses along the top right and then kind of trickles down and you can collect that. Um, you could do that. So people do that for boats. Uh, a lot of uh, people who are sailing for a lot, for a lot of time uh, have those, at least for emergency purposes. Uh, they're looking at that uh, in the context of uh, kind of you know, remote places and you know, deserts and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot there. The main disadvantage is that you're losing a lot of heat um, when the water uh, condenses. So the sun's giving you a lot of energy for free, so that's really good. Uh, and that energy goes on to the evaporation, right? And then, and that's it, you're done. And you could actually recover a lot of that energy if you found fancier ways of, uh, of taking the energy that's being, uh, when the water's condensed. So there's all these other techniques that people are looking at. Not reverse osmosis, so not these kinds of plants. So, um, so, but other plants was, that would use solar energy. I was thinking more on the, along the lines of like a solar power plant where they really, um, refract or mirror, yeah, like you know, parabolically concentrated solar focus the sunlight from giant areas into like one, yeah. one cent, you know, point. But and then they're like boiling it's so hot there and it's boiling you know, so if you can imagine this right next to the, the ocean. Yeah. You know, once you build the planet with the mirrors, yeah. Now it, for like forever it's gonna be sitting there like just boiling the water maybe. I think people are still finding it more economical to use those systems to generate electricity and then use the electricity to run one of these. That's what they do in Spain, at least. Yep. On the uh, like that atmospheric water generation, things we were talking about before, yeah. in my last job we kind of did like a back and envelope assessment of those, at least like with existing technologies. Yeah. And it, it, 
at least in what we saw, it basically, like if you have any access to water, you're like way better off doing RO than any atmospheric water. Yeah. Um, because it's like several orders of magnitude more power to run atmospheric water. Um, so if you really don't have any access to any sort of ground source, then that doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's the funny thing. I mean, desalination kind of has a similar picture, right? It's expensive, but everything else is getting expensive as people run out of options. So um, people are doing it anyway. But I guess you'd still probably want to do that before you uh, look at atmospheric water generation. It'd be interesting to see a chart that has the cost of each different method. Yeah. You know, like, the, like they do for power, you know, like hydropower or solar power. <coughs> yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, also, I mean, I think the question of where is it feasible, you yeah. know, in terms of like, particularly on the energy cost side? I mean, when you look at the developing world, or the developing countries are growing because, you know, there's more the issues around energy and energy costs, and yeah. they're not figured out yet, right? And so, I guess for me, one of the questions would be like, where does this actually make sense? You know, you can, you know, when the energy costs aren't significant, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just like, oh, if you're a coastal country, it makes sense for you because you're right here. Ocean, but have you done that sort of analysis to say like where would desalination make sense from like an energy cost reduction perspective? My sense is that you know just even though I work on desalination, my sense is that you're really usually much better off spending money as much as possible on trying to reduce demand or kind of fix the leaks in your piping system and stuff like that uh, than building a desalination plant. And then at some point, if you really don't have much water at all, then it starts making sense to do that. Um, but, you know, it's hard to predict how much people are going to need the water. Uh, it's also hard to predict how much energy uh, costs are going to be in the future. Is energy going to get more expensive? Uh, it might, right? Uh, if we start pricing carbon in some parts of the world, what does that do to the price of, of, um, of desalination? Um, I don't think it would totally revolution, you know, totally mess up the system, but um, these are things people start, need to start thinking about because you're building a plant and it's going to run for 30 years away. Uh, I wanted to make sure I asked you this. Just in thinking about desal facilities compared to like power generation facilities, can can the rate at which you're producing water through this process can it ramp or vary very much, or does it really need to be sort of humming along at a at a particular rate in order to? You can what you can what you cannot do is really vary how much water each uh, vessel produces because I would mess stuff up. Uh, what you oh, can so do just is take down a few shut down. Yes, yeah, so a lot of it is in parallel. So you can run at 10% capacity. And that's, a, that's something that you can do with RO, but perhaps not with... Uh, some of the thermal processes. Yeah. Maybe? Uh, some of it's parallel, but less so. It's less parallelized. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure you'll necessarily have the answer to this, or maybe people... Yeah, somebody um, else. You seem to have done some work in India and in China. I know that here in the United States, one of the reasons that Ag the agriculture industry is so water intensive is because the prices are artificially low. Of water. Of water, yeah. they artificially low. And so that curve that we saw for India, I'm just wondering how the price of water is set. I know that when you have a small like you know, family plot of land, you just dig a hole and kind of get the water out of the hole. Yeah. And so the price is set by the cost of digging the hole. Yeah. Whereas here, you get water rights from the government. Can you expand on that? And the implications of that for this technology. Well, let's think about this a little bit. I don't know. Well, so I don't know the answer here, but okay. So we're looking at cost of water uh, availability uh, in dollars per cubic meter, right? Um, and we're going from negative to about ten cents per cubic meter, um, or even eighty. I guess eighty cents in the case of desalination. Does anybody know how much water uh, costs here if you're uh, a residential user? That's actually kind of telling. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Does anybody actually pay their water bill? It's really cheap. It's really cheap. It's really cheap. It's cheap. It's very cheap, right? Yeah, exactly. It's even cheaper. New England is classified as a rainforest because it gets over four inches per yeah per year. So it's really cheap. I mean, if we get a ton of water, we pick up. But do we know how cheap? My sense, not being a total expert in, in the pricing side of things, is that um, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 cents per cubic meter is probably what I would kind of expect for a lot of parts of the world. It's probably more expensive in, uh, 
you know, Algeria or in Nevada than it is in, in Boston, for effect. Um, where does that put us? Essentially, it means that building consensus is actually here. So, my sense is, is that residential users are going to be somewhat price sensitive, and if you start uh, building a plant that's going to make water five times more expensive, um, in practice, will it totally change their overall budget? No. Uh, but they might gripe about it, and for good reason, right? Um, but when water is subsidized, and is certainly subsidized in the case of industry, and is certainly subsidized in the case of agriculture, it's basically, you know, here, they don't care about this, right? Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity to try to figure out how to do water pricing better. Um, because people don't think about water. And it's not, you know, there's a big movement, which I don't mean to discredit in any way, um, that kind of emphasizes the fact that you need water to live and that we should think of water as a, as a human right. And I think there's a lot of uh, a virtue to that because you can't just think in terms of numbers and realize that like, oh, well, I guess he just won't be able to drink this month. Um, <laughs> so I think it's, it's very important to think about water in, in terms of, uh, you know, in humanitarian terms. Um, that being said, people tend to kind of extrapolate and therefore figure that they're kind of entitled to unlimited water. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that kind of leads to a lot of inefficiencies, right? Uh, it's a limited resource, we've got to figure out how to allocate it. Um, and maybe, you know, actually I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys how this works in Israel, because I think the, the model's pretty smart. Uh, they consider that everybody needs water to live, which I think is true. Uh, and as a result, the first however many liters per month are actually pretty cheap per person or per household or whatever. And then if you want to consume more than what's kind of established as the minimum you need to live a decent life, then the cost is like, you know, five times more per liter. This is for residential. This is for okay. residential, and I think it's about this. Well, actually, how does it So yeah. here, industrial consumption goes down. Juice. The price per, the marginal cost goes down the more you consume. Really? Okay. I have a, um, I just so looked it up, actually. Oh, how, much, how much does it cost us? In Boston, it's $6 per thousand gallons, and it is regressive. It increases the rate of so um, it's 6.30, so I know you guys probably have a lot more questions for David, but I want to stop because we like to leave the last few minutes for people to ask more questions and network and all that kind of stuff. So please, everybody, give a big round of applause.